thanks to the folks uh, at Whittier for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the folks from um, uh, Westboro Cable TV for coming so that they can, they can rebroadcast this show because I think this topic uh, is a, a lot of times is of importance to people who can't make it here. They're at home. They're either at home because they can't make it or because they're taking care of somebody. So um, I get called by Joanne Swiderski from here at Whittier to talk and asked if I could do a program on a very specific topic, which is mass health. Now, as it happens, mass health is that, that, that topic of qualifying for mass health is probably the most common, the, the biggest discussion that I have with the most people all the time. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Um, there are 70 of us at Myrick. Um, there are 40 in Worcester. There are 20 here in um, Westboro. We're actually the biggest firm in, actually we're the biggest firm outside of Boston. There were 10 lawyers in uh, Boston. So because there are so many lawyers, everybody gets to specialize. Uh, and therefore I get to do nothing but this. I really like this. I'm going to turn 70 in January. My clients still think I'm young. I like that. <laughs> so um, we're, we're, today we're just going to talk about um, qualifying for Mass Health, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. An issue that comes up a lot as folks get older. Um, because they are concerned about what happens if they end up needing to stay in a skilled nursing facility for a prolonged period of time or if they need a lot of help at home in order to keep from going to that skilled nursing facility because as you folks who are all here know um, Medicare just like other health insurance won't cover that kind of care uh, th those are health insurance programs they cover the cost of getting better they don't cost cover the cost of staying the same that's why if you're in a skilled nursing facility to be covered by Medicare, you have to have spent three days at least in a hospital. That's how Medicare shows that you were sick. Uh, and then once you've gotten from there to the nursing home, they'll cover up to 100 days there, in theory, because you're getting better. And by the way, that coverage will stop as soon as the nursing home says that you no longer are getting better. Um, and, and as a result, the typical, the, the median uh, uh, coverage that Medicare provides in a nursing home is for 17 days, not for 100 days. Um, because by that point, it is, it, it, uh, most folks get that certification that they're not getting better, um, or that, and, and therefore that they need to either be on private pay or on mass health. And once you're on private pay, as many folks here know, in this area, the typical cost for nursing home care per month is about $14,000. So people have a concern about that. So when I'm talking to folks in general about these issues, I talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and their goal in life, Frank and Mary's, is they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And I'm using this as the example of where Frank and Mary are as far as assets right now. So they have a house. It's not big. Uh, didn't used to be worth this though. It's now worth four hundred thousand dollars. They have Frank has an IRA worth uh, two hundred thousand dollars, and they have joint savings of two hundred thousand. So they're not doing great. They have total assets of eight hundred thousand dollars. Frank's getting um, Social Security of two thousand. Mary's getting half of his, or one thousand, per month, and that's how they're living. And they're going to be just fine unless they need one of them needs nursing home care, uh, in which case they're confronting this tremendous potential monthly bill. And so the question for them always is, well, what happens if Mary needs nursing home care? Um, what do we do? And the answer, if you're a couple, this is really important. The answer is you can quickly, at that point, Mary can quickly qualify for mass health, even though they've got all these assets. They don't have to have given their assets away ahead of time. They don't have to have waited five years. None of that's the case. Because while there is this general mass health rule that you can't qualify for mass health if you've given things away within the previous five years, in that case, those assets still count uh, towards your, being your assets, that rule does not apply to spouses, to transfers to spouses. So the rules here, in order for Mary to qualify for mass health, she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank can own the house no matter what the value. I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. I got houses worth a ton of money. And as long as the spouse, the healthy spouse owns the house, even if it just got conveyed to him the day before the sick spouse was trying to qualify, house is set. They can have the house no matter what the equity. They can have other rental property um, no matter what the equity. 
Um, this is of some concern to folks who've got a vacation home, because if you've got a vacation home and you've never been earning rent from that vacation home and you're getting older and you're concerned about that, as I tell people, you may want to start figuring out how you can be generating some amount of rent from that vacation home so that if one of you needs nursing home care, you've got some basis to justify the fact that the house is really a, is a rental property. It doesn't have to be rented all the time. It just has to be rented enough so that the rent will cover the taxes, the, intra, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, insurance, and other expenses of the house. Frank's assets can also include other cash or cash equivalent assets up to $126,420. Where does that number come from? It comes from the sky. Social Security, or the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare change that number every year. Goes up slowly. The point is, uh, Frank can actually have that money in the bank. Uh, or it can be in stock. Or if he's got an IRA, it can just be in the IRA, right? So he can have quite a bit of money. But in this case, Frank's over that, right? Because they've got $400,000. He's got a $200,000 IRA, and he's got $200,000 in joint savings. But the other main thing, to, and by the way, as I mentioned to you, there's no look back period between spouses. So literally, if Mary went into the nursing home today, she could transfer all these assets to Frank tomorrow, and they'd no longer be considered hers. But Frank's only, Mary's only problem now in trying to qualify for mass health is that Frank's assets are more than $126,420. Well, so what Frank is going to do, once again, once the assets have all been transferred to him, he's going to keep the house. Say we're going to have, we advise him to keep, say, $100,000. I'll talk about that, the reason for that in a second. Um, and then take the rest of the money to buy an annuity, a very specific kind of annuity. An annuity is, <clears throat> first of all, a contract between you and the insurance company from whom or from which you're buying the annuity. And the contract will say typically, I'm giving you the annuity company some money, and in return, you're gonna make these payments to me. So in this case, the annuity contract has to say that Frank is entitled to equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. If Frank were 80 at this point, his life expectancy would be about nine years. So he would have to buy an annuity saying, equal monthly payments to Frank over a term that is nine years or less. If he does that, the day after he buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for Mass Health because Mary has less than $2,000. Frank owns the house, but that's okay. Frank has less than $126,420 because he only kept 100. And Frank's got this, uh, this income stream that's coming from annu the annuity, but that's not countable because he can have unlimited income. So we've literally done these, we've bought annuities for a million dollars with people. The other thing that you should note is that as far as Frank's IRA is concerned, his IRA, remember he had an IRA for $200,000, he can convert that to one of these annuities without that being a taxable event. So he doesn't have to pay income tax on those $200,000 when he does the conversion. The only disadvantage to Frank of doing this is that according to the standard uh, the standard IRA rules, um, Frank could otherwise keep that two hundred thousand dollars, take his required minimum distributions over the period that the IRS calculates, and that period is based on I won't go through the formula, but the result is he wouldn't get his last payment until he was one hundred and ten. If he lived that long, and then if he died, he could simply take the money at that point and designate his his wife or his kids as the new beneficiary they wouldn't have to take it right away, so that the, the tax would end up getting paid over a much longer time. If Frank buys this annuity, it's a fixed term annuity for a term in this case less than or nine years, which means he is gonna pay all the tax on all of that money over that nine years, because he's gonna get all the money over that period. Um, so the annuity rules, once again, it has to be Frank's actuarial life expectancy or less, uh, equal monthly payments, he can't surrender it early, and, <clears throat> This is important. If, if he does this, and Mary then qualifies for Mass Health, and, and, the, and, and the way that, that that would work once Mary was qualified is Mary would have to pay her income every month to the nursing home still. <clears throat> Remember, that's $1,000 per month. Mass Health would pay all the rest. But if that happens, and, and there's a bill that Mass Health has approved because Mass Health has been making these payments, and then Mary dies, 
or even before Mary dies, Frank dies. If Frank dies and he hasn't received all his annuity payments yet, so he had, say he had bought a nine-year annuity at, with these monthly payments and two or three years later he dies, so there's these remaining annuity payments to be paid. MassHealth will have a lien on the remaining annuity payments. So there is an incentive for Frank when we, if he does this, to buy a short annuity as opposed to a long annuity. The annuity by Mass Health regs can't be longer than his actuarial life expectancy, but it can be shorter than his life expectancy. Because say he gets a three-year annuity instead of a 10-year, by the end of the three years, he's got all of his money back. And once he's got all of his money back, if Mary dies, there's no lien on his assets as long as he's still alive. And we're gonna talk about that what happens if he has died in a second, but the point is he can protect all of his money by getting a shorter annuity. Now, the only disadvantage to getting that shorter annuity is that it's, it's therefore increasing the amount of his monthly checks, and he wants to make sure that his assets remain below $126,420 until Mary has qualified for mass health. As soon as Mary has qualified, Frank can hit the lottery have an infinite amount of money, won't affect Mary's eligibility at all. So the reason why I have, I would have suggested to Frank, only keep $100,000 of your money, use the rest to buy an annuity, is that if he's getting these annuity payments in every month, his money is gonna start piling up. And it's gonna take, from the time all of this happens, say, four months to get Mary qualified for mass health. Once she's qualified, by the way, she will get qualified retroactive to the day on which she became financially eligible. The day on which she had less than 2,000, Frank had less than 126,420. But during that intervening period, she's gotta keep that amount below, he's gotta keep that amount below 126,420. So we typically recommend that people keep a smaller amount of money so that even with those payments coming in, they're not gonna inadvertently go over that limit We've had this problem recently with Mass Health because they're aware that a lot of people are playing this game where they have, we think intentionally, delayed the approval of people who are applying for Mass Health in the hope that it would cause the spouse's amount to go over the magic number, right? So we try to be conservative on that. So you see how that, see how that yeah. basically works? So, once that's done, Mary's now on Mass Health. <coughs> Frank's protected all the money, so now what? The only issue that Frank would, want, would need to want to face in that case, and actually it's an issue that would occur whether Mary is now in a nursing home in Mass Health or not, especially if Mary already has memory problems, but maybe even more broadly. Uh, if, if Frank wants to make sure that his wife, if he dies, is safe, he wants to make sure that she's safe even if she needs nursing home care. Because as we discussed, if she's got, if Frank and Mary have got this kind of assets, Frank dies and leaves Mary with the house and this kind of cash, she's probably going to be okay, unless she needs nursing home care. So the question is, how does he protect her? So when I'm talking to folks like Frank and Mary, it, often I'll, I'll be, they'll be kind of reading a sigh of relief at first, because they thought that they needed to get rid of all of their assets and wait five years before anything could be protected. And I'd say, no, actually, no, as long as you're both alive, you're fine. But what I'll typically tell them is, what you want to do now is change your will to protect each other so that Frank's will would say, when I die, instead of these assets that would have gone to Mary going to Mary, at that point, I want them to go and trust for the benefit of my wife and trust for the benefit of Mary. If he does that, then any of the assets that he dies owning will be safe, non-countable, non-leanable, in the event that Mary subsequently needs to qualify for mass health, or even if she's already on mass health. Suppose he did everything that I said. He transferred everything to himself. He bought an annuity for a short period of time. By three years later, he's got all of his money, all in his name, and then he dies. And Mary has been on Mass Health now for three years, but there's no lien on any of his assets. And as long as he dies with a will that says, I leave everything in trust for the benefit of my spouse, those assets aren't going to be countable or lienable for Mary on Mary's account either. They will remain protected. The trustee um, can be anybody that Frank wants except for Mary. 
In this case, you cannot make your spouse be the trustee for his or her own benefit. In that case, as far as Mass Health was concerned, that person would own the assets, right? So it has to be a third party. So this only works if you have somebody you can trust. Typically, that's a child, but you know, it, all families aren't the same, and maybe that's not a child. And people say, or maybe they don't have any kids. And they'll say, well, what do I do? And I'll say, well, you know, you, you, you can name anybody. Oh, can we name you the lawyer? Yes, but that's a real waste of money. It's a tremendous waste of money. You never want to name the lawyer as the trustee because, you know, what are the functions of the trustee? Kind of make sure the investments are going okay. If it's Mary, make sure that Mary's okay. If she's in the nursing home, make sure you can supplement her income, whatever, whatever, right? You don't need to pay a lawyer $400 an hour in order to do those things, right? The trustee can hire a lawyer if they need a lawyer to do something, or can hire an accountant. So the best trustee is one of your kids or somebody that you can trust. If it's not one of your kids, sometimes even if it is, the best trustee, by the way, is the person who is not going to inherit anything as a result of Mary's death, right? Because sometimes that puts people in kind of an awkward position, right? Even if they were you know, a trusted friend of yours if they know that the choice is between spending the money for the beneficiary or holding it, knowing that when the beneficiary dies, they're getting some of it, sometimes that causes some hard feelings. So you may want to try to avoid that. But in general, typically it's the, it's the kids who are the trustees. The trustee can have total discretion to distribute these funds to the beneficiary, to the wife as the beneficiary, total discretion. So if Mary at that point says, you know, I'm really not sleeping, and talks to one of her kids who was the trustee, says, you know, I'm really not sleeping, knowing that I gotta call you all the time in order to get any money. Um, and so I'd really rather have $100,000 in my bank account. The trustee could say, fine, mom, here, here's the $100,000. Now, once Mary has that $100,000, if she then needs to qualify for mass health, she's gonna have to spend down that $100,000, because it's her asset. But everything else will stay safe. Similarly, if we were having this conversation, and this just goes to the last point, after, for couples who've done that, who do this, I'll always tell them, you know, and they'll say, well, don't we have to move our assets around right now? Don't we have to put them into trust? The answer is no. Trust doesn't kick in until after the first person has died, right? Because the will says these assets now go into this trust. But if somebody gets sick, I'll say, call your doctor and then call me. And then we're gonna figure out whether your assets need to be restructured. For example, say Frank calls me and says, oh, I'm sick. Well, what do you got? Well, I got cancer. I'm really sick. And it doesn't look good, and I'm gonna die in a couple of months. Well, okay, in that case, what we would do at that point, doesn't have to be done before then, we'd shift everything to Frank. So that when Frank dies, all of those assets would flow into this trust for the benefit of his wife. Suppose I'm having the same conversation, but Frank says, oh, I'm having wicked memory problems. I know, I got a diagnosis, I've got, I've got Alzheimer's. In the long run, I may need nursing home care. In that case, <clears throat> you may want to move all the assets to Mary, so that if Mary dies suddenly for some reason, she has a heart attack, whatever, all the assets are gonna be safe for Frank's benefit. In the meantime, if they're both alive and Frank needs to go to, into a nursing home, we can, we can, it's okay, because Mary's got, got all the assets. At that point, we would have her buy that annuity that we talked about. Doesn't have to be done ahead of time. But the point is, if you structure things this way, you don't have to move your assets around ahead of time. You don't put anything into trust ahead of time. But if somebody gets sick, you wanna talk to your doctor, then you wanna talk to your lawyer. So, <clears throat> now we're gonna use now we're going to assume the worst, that Frank and Mary either didn't talk to, us, to me about this beforehand and take my advice, um, um, or that they did talk to me, but they just didn't take my advice, and, and then Frank died. And now Mary's alive, and now Mary's got dementia, or she had a stroke because she was so depressed because Frank died. And, and so now we've got to figure out what to do because she's now in a nursing home. And her goal was to stay in her house until she dies and be buried in the backyard, to leave as much as she can in assets to Frank, to uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. She's now got the same assets. She's got $800,000 in assets, she's got the house, uh, and now she's got Frank's IRA, she's got a bank account. 
So what does she, if, so Mary thinks, and this is really common, typically I'm not talking to Mary at this point, I'm talking to Mary's kids. Right. And, they're, and they're like, oh no, we didn't do anything. It's too late, isn't it? And I'll tell them, I'll say, well, you know, it's too late at this point to 100% save all of the money, right? Which is of course what your mother wanted because your mother wanted to leave her assets to the kids. She didn't want to necessarily leave the assets to the nursing home. I've yet to find a will where somebody says, oh, I really, those nursing homes are great. I think I just want to leave them a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's like, it's like the, the, the number of people who have told me they want to leave some money to the IRS. Oh, the government's been so good to me. I just want to give them a bonus. So the question is, is there any of this money that can be saved? To understand that, you need to understand, uh, first of all, what Mary thinks would happen in this case if she were in the nursing home, and then what would really happen. So Mary th knows that the nursing home is going to cost about $12,000 a month. This is actually a cheap price for around here now, right. but $12,000 a month. So that's $144,000 a year. So she thinks that in this case, or her kids do, that, and, and remember, she's earning $2,000 a month now because she's getting Frank's Social Security check. So $144,000 minus that $24,000, which is 2,000 times 12 months, is $120,000. So she's thinking that she's going to lose from all of her assets. Remember, there were $800,000 in assets. About $120,000 a year, and that over five years, if she lived that long, she will have lost six hundred thousand dollars, five times one hundred and twenty, right? Leaving her kids with the remainder of only two hundred thousand dollars. So, this is what would really happen if she talked to a lawyer. You know, if she, if she get the because many, a lot of people don't talk to lawyers in this case. In these cases, it simply astonishes me. So, what really would happen is Mary would qualify would qualify for Mass Health. How would she do that? Well, first of all, remember. Uh, the house, I shouldn't say remember, I didn't mention this in the earlier part because it wasn't relevant. Even if Mary owns the house, at this point the house is not a countable asset for purposes of her qualifying for Mass Health. Mass Health would, it would, once she qualified, have a lien on that house to make sure they got repaid following her death. But in terms of her qualifying, as long as she says in her application she intends to return home, even if there's no chance that she could return home, uh, the house is not a countable asset. So she, but then she's got this remaining pile of money, right? She's got $400,000. She's got her husband's old IRA and she's got the other cash. Well, she has two possible things that she can do with that money. She can put the money into something called a D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. That's about the right number. One out of about a little over 20 people, right? Or, and or, she could actually do both. She could buy an annuity. And as long as the annuity, see if this sounds familiar, calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Mary's actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non to a non countable income stream for purposes of qualifying. So the day after she does one of those two things or both, thereby reducing her remaining assets to less than two thousand dollars, she qualifies for mass health. Now. The bad news is that once she has done that and she's on Mass Health and she's now paying the remember she's paying her Social Security to the nursing home and Mass Health's paying all the rest. And when she dies, Mass Health is going to have a lien on the house. If she's put money into the D4C pool trust on the remaining money in the truck and on any remaining payments in the annuity. So why in the world would Mary bother doing any of that stuff? Right? And the answer is this. When Mary is on at the, in that nursing home on private pay, we're, we're estimating she's paying about $12,000 per month, or about $144,000 a year. The moment that she qualifies for Mass Health, that bed rate, the same bed in the same nursing home, and by the way, to the best of my knowledge, all nursing homes take patients that are, that are, that are on Mass Health. As a matter of fact, about 70 to 80 percent of all nursing home beds are occupied by people who are on Mass Health, right? So it isn't like, oh boy, we have to go to a crummy nursing home. No, all nursing homes take. So once she's on Mass Health, her rate in that nursing home drops to the Medicaid rate. Now, just like I was just estimating the $12,000 a month is the private pay rate, 
I'm estimating that the mass health rate will be about $7,000 because each uh, nursing home's rate, just like on the private pay side, each nursing home's rate varies. Each nursing home negotiates its own rate with mass health. These get negotiated again every year. And those rates vary depending on how sick Mary is. There's actually a chart through which, through which the nursing home has to estimate the number of nurse minutes per day that are needed by Mary when she's in that nursing home. And that gets reevaluated every six months. So the sicker she is, the more MassHealth will pay the nursing home. Whereas if she doesn't need, doesn't need very many nurse minutes, the, nurse, the, the, the rate is lower. But on average, that, that monthly rate is going to be about $7,000. So 12 minus 7, right, is $5,000. Or, or, times, or times 12 months is $60,000. So the reduction in the total cost of the nursing home per year is about $60,000 because suddenly her, Mar Mary's payments are, or, or the, the, in terms of the amount that the lien, of lien that's accruing every year, it's eighty-four thousand dollars, which is seven thousand minus twelve, minus the twenty-four thousand. Right? Remember, that's the amount that Mary's paying in Social Security. Means that her burn rate, the amount uh, that she's going to have to pay back from her assets, which are now the house and in, in, in the money in the D4C, and then the annuity payments, is only going to be sixty thousand a month, or excuse me, sixty thousand a year, or at the end of five years, three hundred thousand dollars. So if Mary was in the nursing home for those five years on mass health, um, and then at, after she died, the kids paid the lien off, right? The, the mass health lien, right? There's still going to be five hundred thousand dollars left. So, once again, the, the key takeaway is you can always qualify for mass health if you're um, if you're a couple, you can do it easily by just shifting assets to the other spouse and having the other spouse do some stuff. If you're single, you can always still qualify. But then that leads to, so what exactly is that D4C pool trust? What's that about? And how does the annuity work? First, the D4C pool trust. Uh, the, the, the letters, or the, the, the letters and number, D4C, are actually the last three letters of the statutory citation of the section in the federal Medicaid law that allows this. But so the shorthand is everybody refers to them as D4Cs. It's actually uh, 42 USC, United States Code, 1396P something something D4C. That's actually, it's really in there someplace in the United States, in the code of all of the United States laws. So the D4C pool trust, if you want to learn about them, first of all, more generally, just Google pooled trust and you'll get a ton of websites that are talking to you about them. Uh, or you can contact, and this is all in your in your uh, handouts. Um, you can contact one of the five pooled trusts that are in Massachusetts and that are operate operating. The general rule is a pooled trust has to be operated by a nonprofit organization that is operating for the benefit of elderly and disabled people. The way that it works is you enter into a contract, excuse me, with this organization. Uh, whereby you agree to transfer some money to them, to their trust. That money gets pooled with all the other money that they have and invested and reinvested. And you, if you're married, earn interest on that money, right? And their interest rates aren't bad. Typically, they're going to be earning about 5% a year right now, right? And they'll charge a fee, just like any money manager will charge. They'll charge, they'll charge 1%. Um, uh, uh, so, so there is a there is a cost involved, but it's not a huge cost. It's the same that you would be paying about if you were if you were otherwise investing your money. But then, and and by the way, this is if if you go to their website, this is the one we use the most. It's called Plan of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, it's located in I think Dedham now, um, just because they're close and they're convenient. <coughs> Trans money transferred into the funds are not countable. Um, there is no look back period in Massachusetts right now. There is proposed legislation that would cap the amount that can go into the pooled trust at $750,000, but we'll see how that goes. There is also proposed a proposed regulatory change that would change all of these rules so that you couldn't do this anymore. In most states, in, in about, I think, 35 out of the 50 states, transfers into the pooled trust are subject to this five-year look-back period, and therefore they're not useful when you're trying to do things at the last minute. 
In, in Massachusetts, though, they are allowable. There was discussion about changing that, it, but there's been a lot of pushback on that, and at this point, it, this is all still, still valid. And remember, at the end of the day, MassHealth does a lean on the remaining money. Application costs run between about $750 and $2,000. Um, the annual fee is typically a percentage of the total assets, typically about 1%. <clears throat> The only hooker, or, or kicker is, when, when Mary dies, if there's still money in the pool trust, the, the pool trust entity can take a percentage of that money. It'll be in your contract, and it will vary depending on which, group you, which, which pool trust you're using and, and how long the money's been in there. And it varies between 5 and 25% of the remaining amount of the assets. Those, money, those funds come off the top before ma the mass health lien applies. So the use of the funds. So say I'm married, and I'm in a nursing home, and I may be living there for a while, and I've got dementia, and that's why I'm there, but I'm otherwise okay. You know, I can get around, I'm using a wheelchair, I can, but, 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 I, but I'm, I'm mobile. Um, so what, in that situation, if Mary is stuck there, the great thing about these funds is that they can be used to supplement Mary's care because MassHealth is paying most of the bill, right? The Social Security check and MassHealth are paying the bill. Now there's this pool of money that can help Mary live there. Uh, and I just gave you a few examples. It can, it can provide much better equipment. The most, how many people here have ever been to a nursing home? Raise your hand. Uh, about a little more than half. So for me, I go to a lot of nursing homes. And some are really better than others. Um, but the most consistently depressing part about the nursing home um, is being in a, one of the residential wings and there's somebody sitting in a wheelchair in the hall kind of slumped over like this. Right. And trying to, right, the worst. Now, why is that happening? That is happening because that person is sitting in the wrong wheelchair. They're sitting in a wheelchair that's owned by the nursing home and that was meant not to sleep in, but to get somebody from one room to another. So it's got the flat, you know, stiff yeah. back, and the aluminum things, you know, and the, and, the little, and the cloth seat or whatever, the plastic seat, right? And that's owned by the nursing home and costs less than $1,000 or $1,000. But $10,000, you can buy one that reclines and it's got a little cup holder and you get a little TV set, you know, actually you can make it a power. You may not want that in Mary's case, depending on your dementia, but the point is, Mary's in the nursing home and she's not happy about that. And her life isn't what it was. But with some money, you can make her life much better than it might be. And that's the nice thing about having the funds in the D4C, right? So that you can really use it to improve Mary's life while she's there. Um, knowing that there's a lien at the end, but that the result of putting the money in and thereby qualifying her for mass health um, is that you've substantially reduced the monthly nursing home cost. I'll just mention one other, oh, there's also food. I'll just, so one food story. I remember doing one of these presentations several years ago, and afterwards a woman came up and said, Mr. Bergeron, she said, I'm really sorry that I didn't know about this, because my mother started off with like $300,000, and she's only got like 70 left. And because, of course, at nursing home rates, that money goes pretty fast, right? So she said, it really wouldn't be worth it for me to do this now, would it? I said, sure it would. I said, $70,000 when you're paying the nursing home doesn't sound like much money. But in the real world, that's a lot of money, right? I said, you know, it might be helpful that you can really help your mother this way. So, so she did. She took the seventy thousand dollars, we put it into a D four C, and then, and then, um, what happens once the money's in the D four C is that typically the D four C folks will have a social worker that will come and talk to you if you're competent, or talk to the person you named in, in, as your as your attorney and your power of attorney. And so that's what happened. The lady came up and talked to this woman, and said, so, you know, so what would your mother like? You know, you know. We've got this money. Does she like watching old movies? You know, I mean, we could buy her a flat screen TV. We can give her like, you know, the, the little pods. At that time, it was, it was buy them DVDs to watch. You don't need it anymore. You just get Netflix, you know. But you know, it's, you know, you could, your mother can watch her favorite movie a thousand times, you know. And if she's got dementia, every time is going to be a fresh experience. <laughs> it's right. Well, actually, she said, my mother doesn't see very well. <clears throat> oh, well, how about <clears throat> music? You know, can we can we get her a you know a, a, a you know a, a, a you know, music player? Same thing. We do headphones. We give her some privacy. No, my mother isn't here very well either. She said. So the lady said, "Well, what about food? Is there anything special that your mother likes?" 
woman, the woman said, oh, you know, I, we, we grew up pretty poor, and so we didn't go out to eat, you know. But once a year, we go to Maine, and we would always get lobster in the rough. My mother loved lobster. And the social worker said, your mother can have lobster anytime she wants, right? Because there was some money. So I saw this lady about a couple years later. And, and so I asked, I said, how's your mother? She said, oh, she died. She had died like fairly recently. She lived about another two years. I said, did she ever have lobster? She said, every week. She always had lobster. So the point is, it can be used for, you know, just to improve the life of that person. Finally, I'm just gonna mention the house. So remember, in this situation, Mary qualified for Mass Health and kept the house. But remember, now all of her income is going to the nursing home, which means there's no money to pay the house bills, pay the taxes, the insurance, the upkeep. The D4C can take, take care of the house, can pay for all the, uh, all the house payments. So that's the D4C. The annuity, once again, we've already talked about this a little bit. The annuity has to be irrevocable and unamendable. Equal monthly payments. Payments have to start within 60 days. Uh, and they have to be for a period shorter than Mary's, Mary's actuarial life expectancy. Mary's life expectancy at 80 is actually a little longer than Frank's. It's 10.1 years, so the annuity could be as long as 10 years. There is a mass health lien on the remaining payments. And, remember this one, interest rate is terrible. The interest on, on these annuities is typically about 1%. So, whenever you're doing any of this, you have to be weighing the, the advantage of qualifying for mass health versus the disadvantage that your return on your investment compared to what you're now getting is probably going to be quite a bit lower. Now, if you've got a fairly small amount of money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, say if you had a hundred thousand dollars and your current return on investment is four percent or four thousand dollars, and your return here is going to be one percent or one thousand dollars, that means you've lost that three thousand dollars every year, right? And that's not good. But say you had a million dollars. Now all of a sudden, you've lost $30,000. The difference between $40,000 and $10,000. Well, that's much more serious. But so the point is, it's always a matter of kind of weighing these things out. But in this case, if the alternative is to, for Mary to be paying on the nursing home at the private pay rate, unless she's only gonna live for a very short time, it always makes sense to qualify for mass health. Now, in, in all of those scenarios, at the end of the day, Mass Health gets repaid, and therefore you haven't saved all of Mary's money. The only way that Mary can save all of her money is the part that you all walked in here already knowing. This is why I'm not spending a lot of time on it, right? <clears throat> the only way that Mary can save money uh, from being countable she's, before she qualifies for Mass Health or from being lienable is by transferring it out of her name and waiting five years. Now, it does not have to get transferred to an irrevocable trust. It can simply be transferred to your kids. Um, oftentimes, if there's only one child, that's exactly what, the, what, the, what Mary would do. She's got a trusted child, so just give everything to the child. Um, you, the time that typically that doesn't happen is either if that child has creditor problems or potentially a divorce problem, uh, or has got college applications that may be coming in and now they know these assets that she now has are going to get counted as her assets and therefore reduce the amount of her of the grandchildren's you know, college benefits, right? So in those in those cases, or um, if there are multiple kids, um, and and Mary is concerned that she doesn't want to distribute money to all the kids, she trusts at least one of them, but maybe she's got one that's got trouble, or she's got one that's got a divorce problem or a creditor problem. In that case, what she will do is she'll create an irrevocable trust. Um, and she'll name one of those kids as the trustee, the most trusted one. You know, I always tell my clients, the greatest blessing you can have in life is a trusted child as you get older. There's nothing harder, I, I see it, there's nothing harder than a person getting older knowing that at some point you're not going to be as on top of your game as you otherwise were and that there's no one you can really trust, right? So. You, you find a trusted person, and once again, going back to something I said earlier, that trustee, uh, as opposed to the ultimate beneficiaries that she wants to have be her kids, that trustee can be anybody. It doesn't have to be one of the kids. It can be your best friend. It can be a niece or nephew. It can be anybody. And they'll, and, you know, and she'll say, oh, well, you know, it's got to be a person that's really young. It doesn't have to be really young. I mean, if Mary's already 80, 85, 
Trusty doesn't have to be that old or, or that young because Mary's going to be dead, you know, within, not within the immediate future, but in the foreseeable future, right? So you want to trust the trustee. The rules. Mary can't be a beneficiary here. To the extent that Mary is a beneficiary of this trust, um, those the assets that are in trust are still countable, countable by mass health and will disqualify her from qualifying. Um, typically, the children of the beneficiaries. Um, and then, and, and of course, nobody likes this, right? So Mary doesn't like doing this because she's losing control of these assets. Um, and But she says, you mean I get no way to get them back? And I'll tell her, well, yes, there's a way to get them back, but you can't force anybody to give them back to you. <clears throat> the standard way back, and you've probably all heard this before too, is you name the children as the beneficiaries of this trust. You say in the trust, when Mary dies, the remaining assets get divided among the children. Until then, though, the trustee retains the discretion to distribute money, but only to one of the kids, right? So that during Mary's lifetime, the trustee can distribute money to one of the kids. But it is assumed by the mother that the money is going to the trusted child, who is then going to just give it back to Mary. And all of that is legitimate. The fact that the money can go to a child the fact that only this trustee, this trustee has complete discretion to distribute it. The fact that the child may be giving the money back to the parent in no way invalidates any of this. We know this because MassHealth claimed in a case that this was invalid and it went all the way up to the Supreme Judicial Court. And about two years ago, one of our lawyers, Lisa Neely at Myrick O'Connell, argued this case and won. So we know that all these rules work, right? Most trusted child is the trustee if you're worried about this issue of, you know, I trust her now, but you know, you never know, right? You can keep the power to change the trustee, right? You can't be the trustee and you can't be the beneficiary, but you can keep the power at any time to get to dump the trustee if you think that the trustee is not being trustworthy enough and just name somebody else, right? And if you're concerned that the power might get abused after you're disabled, then you can give somebody else the power to change the trustee. Somebody who ideally is not is is another third party who doesn't have a, you know skin in the game, isn't going to get anything from this trust. And you say that person always has the power to change the trustee. So, to summarize, if you're married, either one of you can always qualify for mass health at the last minute. Don't have to do any advanced planning for it. Just follow the instructions. It's easy, right? If your, if one of you is dead and the other one wants to qualify for mass health right now, you can. You can always qualify for mass health. So you're going to end up having to spend some money to pay back mass health because of the mass health lien, but you'll still save a tremendous amount of money by qualifying for mass health. If you're single though and you want to save all of your money, there is no escape from the, the device that you all walked in here knowing about which is give it away and wait five years. You don't have to give it away to an irrevocable trust. You can give it away just to your kids. And by the way, there's no, in terms of giving away money, there is no bad tax consequence to that. There is this myth that there's some limit on the amount that you can give away in a year. And I bet if I asked what that limit was, somebody here would say $15,000. There really is no limit. There really is no limit. So Mary could give away all this money today there wouldn't be the only, and her only tax consequence would be, she's got some money in an IRA. Before she can give it away, she'd have to cash out the IRA and pay the tax. But in terms of giving it away, if she gave her money away today to her kids, there is no gift tax, and the receipt of a gift is not income. So there is no, in, there is nothing bad for tax purposes about just giving it away. For, for, for in terms of the house, the only issue regarding the house is that if she gives the house away to her kids that $400,000 house that she and Frank bought a million years ago for like $20,000, right? And the kids go to sell the house, they're probably gonna to need to pay a capital gains tax unless they've been living at the house, right? Because they don't get the exemption. The way to deal with that, if you're giving the child this away, away for these purposes, is you give them a remainder interest in the house, a remainder interest in the house, you keep a life estate in the house. What is that? A life estate is total control till the moment that you die but it expires the moment that you die. The remainder interest is total control the moment after you die. 
Uh, if you do that, if you give away the remainder interest to the kids and keep the life estate, you keep total control of the house while you're alive, kids can't throw you out. You're still responsible for the taxes and the insurance. If you rent the house, you're entitled to the rent. You know, just like you still own the house. Um, but five years after you've made that transfer, the remainder interest that you gave to the kids is no longer countable or lienable. Uh, if you tried to qualify for Mass Health at that point, Mass Health would qualify you. They'd put a lien on your life estate because you still own it. But at the moment of your death, your life estate evaporates, as we've said, and therefore so would the lien. So the kids end up with the house um, lien free. And because you kept the life estate for capital gains purposes and estate tax purposes, when you die, um, the, the so-called tax basis of the house jumps to the date of death value. So when the kids sell, they don't pay any capital gains. So the point is you can just give it away, right? Uh, if I talked too fast, which some people have accused me of doing <laughs> in the past, uh, or if you're just a little confused and you want to see this again, first of all, you'll be able to watch it on Westboro Cable. And thank you, Aiden, for filming this, one of the great videographers here in Massachusetts. Um, also, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube um, um, channel, uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary. So you can see this or any of the other presentations that I do on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Any questions? We covered a lot of stuff. Yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, ma'am. What's the expected life for a male and female? If Frank, and, if Frank were 80, his actuarial life expectancy would be nine point something years. <coughs> Mary's is, is 10 point something years. If Mary were 90, I know these figures because I just did this. Up, the, your actuarial life expectancy changes every year. Every year you live, your life expectancy goes down by like eight months or nine months. That's the reason why, you know, people, I'll give these numbers and the people say, wait a minute, actuarial life expectancy, that's like 80 years, right? Well, yes, if you're zero, you know, if you're born today, your life expectancy would be 80 something years, right? If you were 100 today, your life expectancy would be a little over two years. Just because you're still standing, by virtue of the fact that you're still standing, right? So it changes every year. Uh, but but Mass Health there, has a table. Oh, they like have the ones to determine it, Mass Health? That's right. That's right. But, and they've actually, they used to keep their own table, and now they've deferred to uh, Social Security. Social Security keeps these tables, and they're separate tables for males and females. It's the same table they use to figure out if you sell the house and someone's got a life estate and someone has a remainder, which piece of the gain is attributable to the life estate and which piece is attributable to the remainder. But the point, the point is they've, they've got all that stuff. Yes, sir? I have a couple of questions, if I may. <clears throat> First of all, with the D4C yep. trust, can you put all of your money into the D4C trust? Can you put a million between 700000 could you put the full 750000 of your assets into the D4C trust? question is, could you put all of your money into the D4C? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, what is the limitations on withdrawal on a yearly basis or a percentage basis? The question is, what is the limitation on withdrawal? There is no limit. There is no limit. So could you... But, but, the, but, but remember, the, D4, the, the one limitation is that the D4C, if you put your money in there, can't give you money. Because if you get, because if they could give you money, well then that would be money that would be countable, and you couldn't qualify for mass health. They can buy anything you need, and typically the way this works is that the, is that your the person with your power of attorney, right, or other people who you know will buy will either say, you know, Dad really loves that wheelchair, you know, it's going to be terrific, and it's a big item. So what they'll what they'll do is the DFC will simply pay the the ten thousand dollars directly to the wheelchair company, or you know, we go out with we go out to eat every week uh, with Dad. I, I don't want to, in, in which case that you get reimbursed. I don't want to go into yeah. personal yeah. satisfaction. You know, I'm just but I just wanted to just see how the mechan what the mechanism is. So yeah. the DFC cannot designate a, a D4C distribution to a qualified charity? No, not while the person is let's see. To a qualified charity. Hmm. No, not while the person's alive. Money has to stay there. Money, has, the, the money that is not being used for the benefit of Mary has to stay in the pile. The reason is, the reason why the government allows this is because the government has a lien at the end. And they don't want there to be a device through which you can avoid the lien by having the D4C give away your money as opposed to you giving away your money, which would, then be, would have been subject to the five-year look-back period. The five-year look-back period, I, I have a lot. Is the five-year look-back period uh, uh, 
prevent you from making a uh, distribution or a gift to a ch qualified charity. Does, the, does, and I'm just repeating just because this is on, because we're taping this. Does the five year look back period, forget about the D4C, keep you from giving a, a donation to a charity? Yes. Yes. Prohibits all distributions to anybody, to anybody or anything for less than fair market value. And, and I'll just, but I'll tell you, I'm just going to say, tell you the one little, the, 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 the little phrase in the regulation that is the way through which you try to get out of that is it prohibits all of those gifts if any of the reason for the gift was to try to qualify for mass health. So you can always make the argument when you made that gift, even if it was made during that five year look back period, that you really didn't do it in order to rearrange your assets and qualify for mass health. That argument is a lot easier to make if it happened four years ago, as opposed to after you got dementia. Uh, and if it happened for a reason that sounds like a, a reasonable reason, like it paid my grandchild's college tuition, right? So, so, but that's the only way out of, that's the only wiggle room regarding the five year look back period. That's just a different way. What if that charity is in your will and you move it forward to, uh, in, in your lifetime? The question is, what if the charity was in your will and you're yes. moving it forward in your lifetime? I would say that doesn't help you because, because the mass health folks, especially if it was done fairly, um, in fairly close proximity to when you were trying to apply for Mass Health, we're just saying, well, this is all he's doing. He'd like to give the money to the charity. He knows he's going to be in a nursing home and doesn't want to get paid the nursing home, and so he's trying to get around it. Absolutely. Right? One last question. I just want to make sure there are no other questions, just because we're going to wrap up before we come back to that. Any other questions from anybody? Mm, yes, sir. Or, or yes, sir, and then you, sir, and then I'm going to go back. Yes, sir. What's the average lifespan when they go in a nursing home? Shorter. What, what is the lifespan? The, the, the median stay in a nursing home is about is less than two years, right? Right. Average is um, lower than that, or it's just a little bit less than two years. Average is lower because a lot of people die within six months because they came out. They remember they come out of the hospital. They go into the nursing home, right? I, and I've never had anyone that lived longer than ten years, right? You go through a lot of money. In 10 years. You go through a lot of money in ten years. Yes, sir. The $15,000 rule, uh, could you expound on why that's due? Sure, I'm going to give 60 seconds on the $15,000 rule. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. There is a federal combined gift and estate tax system. And the way the system works is, <clears throat> if you die, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you leave everything to your spouse, there's no, that's a, you subtract that from the taxable estate. But if you die leaving a taxable estate, um, or greater than a specific amount, a particular amount, which right now is a little more than $14.1 million, then there's an estate tax. Well, Massachusetts never figured out the fact that, you know, if you just give everything away the day before you die, you can avoid the estate tax, which is true in Massachusetts. You give everything away the day before you die, you avoid the estate tax. Federally, though, they adopted a gift tax in order to keep people from doing that. And they said, if you give away more than a particular amount, there's going to be a gift tax. Now, but there are two exclusions to the gift tax. The one everybody knows, and the one that nobody knows. The first exclusion, everybody knows. In any one year, you can't give any one person more than a specific amount, which used to be $10,000, but there's, but there's an inflation component to it. It's now up to 15. Right. The other one is, for any amounts that are over those amounts, you have a lifetime additional exclusion equal to the estate tax exclusion, $11.1 million. So if you're giving away in your lifetime less than a total of $11.1 million, effectively, there is no gift tax. It's totally irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. How's that? It's a piece of trivia for you. Right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm going to take one more, and then, I'm, and then it's almost, and then I want to close. Yes, sir. This is probably personal. <laughs> Uh, you frowned on uh, selecting a, an attorney as a trustee, but doesn't an attorney have the benefit, or don't you have the benefit if you select an attorney for a trustee, but an attorney is ethically and financially, as a, finance, as a fiduciary responsibility that a regular person, like your children or your best friend, does not have? 
it, it, the question is, isn't, isn't it true, it, wouldn't it be true that a, a, a lawyer as a trustee would have a kind of a financial responsibility, responsibility. That, another, that another person wouldn't have? Well, actually, no. Everybody who is, who is named as the trustee has the same legally binding fiduciary responsibilities. The only question is, are they going to try to shave corners? Now, the person who has an interest in shaving a corner is the person who ultimately is not only the trustee, but may be a beneficiary after you die. Whereas, whereas, and that's true, but that's true also of a lot of other people. In this case, everybody except Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They're not getting anything after I die. Yeah, they're going to do me a favor and be my trustee. No, and, no, and, and trustees get paid. Trustees do get paid. Trustees get, get paid on an hourly basis, what is considered to be a reasonable amount in this area. And, and there's no official amount in this area. If you went to if you went to Middlesex Probate Court with a case where a trustee is asking for fifty dollars an hour, that would be considered a reasonable amount. If you went to Worcester Probate Court, it would be less than that, right? But not a lot less, right? It kind of varies depending on the area. But the point is, a trustee can pay himself or herself what is considered to be a reasonable amount. So you're not asking somebody to just do this as a favor. Can a lawyer do the same thing? Lawyer will never charge you fifty or sixty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> With that, thank you very much all for coming. Uh, and we just need to thank you.